the features of the same face. Oh, my soul. Let me be in you now. Look out through my eyes. Look out at the things you made. All things shining. Next, we have physical symptoms of stress. I'm not going to go through each one, but pretty much as previous research has found, lots of fatigue, headaches, stomach aches, and all around physical discomfort associated with Ramadan. And also other periods of fasting too, right? There's a whole litany of research on intermittent fasting not related to uh, spirituality. Um, it's a period of intense fasting, so it's a little surprise. What is surprising here was the depression and sadness category. I mean, look at this huge increase after Ramadan for Muslims, which is surprising if you remember the subjective well-being graph, right? So it tells us two different things. Muslims are reporting higher rates of sadness and also generally positive mood or at least better mood than Christian students, right? Well, if you've seen the film Inside Out, we are complex creatures. We have complex emotions. We can have more than one emotion at a time. Two things here. The role of sadness is an integral part of forming one's Islamic identity as, it's expressed, as it expresses ultimate humility towards Allah as noted in this beautiful quote right here. As well as many, of, many Shia rituals, for example, such as Masayib or Matam, in which expression of sadness through rituals to commemorate, commemorate the sacrifice of certain figures, certain Imams, is a fundamental part of that spiritual philosophy, right? So... This is why the shrine is more than just a place to visit for these people. It's more like home. It's interesting, right? Look at how, uh, and I always think about this, right? When I go to a, when I go to a church, right, especially some like Protestant. Uh, black churches, right? La hallelujah. Lots of emphasis on happiness, right? Leave your sadness behind, right? Really like extroversion, so much happiness. Oh, that was so beautiful. Yeah, wasn't it great? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Come on, everybody up. Turn around, turn around, this way. Give me that old time religion. Amen. God bless you and good afternoon. Compare that image, right? And this is a picture right here. Compare that image to some Shia rituals in which it's the opposite, right? You're meant to bring out your soft heart, your gentle nature, right? You're, there's so many hadith, so many sayings from the Imams as to one single tear, one single one single tear shed for the stories of the Imams will lead you to paradise, right? So there's this emphasis on crying, on voluntarily bringing out sadness, right? Which is very interesting, right? And this also relates to a future video I'm creating related to my upcoming book chapter, and that is broadening how well-being is conceptualized to incorporate metaphysical presuppositions of existence. Let me give you an example. The eudaimonic well-being scale that I used, and I had to use that scale, right? You can't just create skills on your own. I'm pigeonholed by where the profession where the discipline of psychology is at current at the current time right all of the questions every single item was in relation to the self right i i have found my true purpose in life i believe in my capability to achieve things no mention of things like community culture transcendence spiritual experiences ancestry leaving a legacy for future generations right this might have been one of the confounding aspects because our christian population was largely Hispanic and Catholic, which are both largely collectivistic, communal. He began to have doubts. 
Had he set his course right, was he still going on towards his home, or was he horribly lost and doomed to a terrible death? No way to know. The message of the constellations, had he imagined it because of his desperate circumstance, or had he seen truth once and now had to hold on to it without further reassurance? Doubt can be a bond as powerful and sustaining as certainty. When you are lost, you are not alone. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And here's an article by Cohen, which found that Catholics endorse more collectivistic aspects of religion, such as tradition, community, and social interaction, as opposed to Protestants, who emphasize personal relationship with God, a more individualistic one-on-one -on -one experience with their Creator. Which isn't surprising, right? It's one of the main reasons that the Protestant Reformation happened or emerged was to bypass the hierarchical role of the Catholic bishops, clergy, and the Pope. Um, and one of my professors, right, since I, I had to defend this, right, I had to defend this to my professor, my mentor, and another professor. He had this, um, uh, he had this to say about these findings that I have, um, that I should have captured acculturation, right, in one form of, or another, right? Acculturation is uh, receiving the dominant culture when you have your own heritage cult culture and how that's lost, right? The loss of your heritage culture, culture and the gain of the dominant culture, which is what me as a second generation immigrant, you know, for sure, right? I have come to encapsulate or entrench the dominant sociocultural ideals of being a university student of being an american as opposed to growing up when i was just with my parents right where i was uh, more entrenched in pakistani ideals right? measuring acculturative stress measuring acculturation as a construct would have given a more complete picture as to things which we didn't predict like why the christian students had lower positive affect scores or why even the muslims had higher depression scores right so a future direction for me to go to, perhaps. Lastly, we didn't find any significance on any of the stress measures apart from academic stress, which was confounded by the fact that we didn't ask whether students were taking summer classes. Um, since I, I said that a majority of the Christian students were freshmen or sophomore, we can guess that they'd probably be taking more summer classes and experiencing stress because of it. The cat is that on the mat. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Hopkins. You have the first poem to ever have a negative score on the Pritchard scale. <laughs> we're not laughing at you, we're laughing near you. I don't mind that your poem had a simple theme. Sometimes the most beautiful poetry can be about simple things, like a cat, or a flower, or rain. You see, poetry can come from anything with the stuff of revelation in it. Just don't let your poems be ordinary. Hey, the first thing that pops into your head, even if it's total gibberish. Go on, go on. Uh, a sweaty tooth madman. Good God, boy, there's a poet in you after all. There, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close them. Now, describe what you see. Uh, I, I close my eyes. Yes? Uh, and this image floats beside me. The sweaty tooth madman. The sweaty tooth madman with a stare that pounds my brain. Oh, that's excellent. Now, give him action. Make him do something. His hands reach out and choke me. That's wonderful. Wonderful. 
And all the time he's mumbling. What's he mumbling? Uh, mumbling truth. Yeah. Truth like, like a blanket that always leaves your feet cold. Forget them, forget them. Stay with the blanket. Tell me about that blanket. You, 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 you push it, stretch it, it'll never be enough. You kick at it, beat it, it'll never cover any of us. From the moment we enter crying to, to the moment we leave dying, it'll just cover your face as you wail and cry and scream. <laughs>